Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Among the news items we have for you this week, Air New Zealand has started to weigh passengers before they go on flights. The FDA has approved an RSV vaccine. More noteworthy retractions have occurred this week regarding the HPV vaccine. The FDA has approved Elon Musk's neural link for clinical trials. How adding gold to something like wine can drastically improve its taste. The weird behavior of animals when exposed to ultrasounds. A technological development that allows for creation of energy from nothing but air. And the discovery of an Earth-like planet covered in volcanoes. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Starting with the uh, awkwardness of airlines and air travel in general. The idea is normally you would arrive at an airport hours beforehand to find your way through all of the various checkpoints that are involved. Get your baggage weighed, be scalped by the airline for the excess fees they provide for what is fairly typical passenger's luggage, and then find yourself stuck in a very uncomfortable tiny seat unless you pay a fortune for either business or first class travel. It appears that you may now also need to add being weighed by the airline before you board the aircraft. Strangely, this is not being driven by the uh, long pushed for idea that those who are much larger should pay more because they simply don't fit into a standard airline seat, at least economy class. Rather, this is driven by a regulator's decision to have a better indicator of what the average individual weighs for the purposes of balancing and properly understanding how to account for the weight of an aircraft. And this is not just the aircraft's weight, but everything on board. Luggage, individuals, seats, even food. Everything is weighed for that reason. This is being done to get an average weight of every individual who's boarding. And that means they can figure out, without having to do this to every individual person, what your average traveller weighs. Admittedly, there are companies that are actually planning to charge you by your weight, which will be interesting. Other than being embarrassed by your air travel, you might at least be feeling somewhat more optimistic, given that the FDA has indeed approved Pfizer's RSV vaccine for older adults. This is slightly different to past news, where the expectation was that they would give approval for pregnant mothers. The idea is that you vaccinate the mother while carrying the infant, and that protection carries through at least six months after birth, and that means that you have very little to worry about. In this case, it's for older adults, and this is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Not because they're just giving a wider approval, but that very young and very old people have a lot in common. In this case, older adults have to worry about respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, just as much as infants do, and it can be just as fatal, if not fatal, considerably adverse to their health and quality of life. The vaccine, as it's been approved now, is not perfect, and this is perfectly reasonable as well. Not every treatment is going to be absolutely perfect. What's important is that it is 67% effective at protecting against mild illnesses and 86% against severe illnesses. This is based on studies with about 37,000 people across the world. That's enough to be able to avoid the worst of most circumstances for the elderly individuals getting this shot. Admittedly, 86% isn't perfect, and ideally if you get it up to 90 or even 95%, we might begin seeing herd immunity come into effect, but 86% is likely to curtail its spread considerably. Going from uh, clinical treatments that have been shown to work in the form of vaccines to what are arguably clinical treatments that have no bases whatsoever, IV vitamin drips for infertility. Whether you are a male or a female, infertility may be a concern to you, either issues to do with carrying a fetus to term, the issues around ovulation, or sperm production. No matter what it is, you may or may not need to worry about this, but about 1 in 6 adults will. This is why they are a very good target market 
for those who are less than scrupulous. In this case, the idea of selling IV vitamins as a solution is simply bullshit. We already have a video on why IV vitamins do nothing for you, and that's for a simple reason. Those who tend to go into this sort of area to get treatment are already either healthy, well off, or, in some cases, gambling on something that's not going to produce the results they want because they're desperate. And this last group is one that is being particularly preyed on. We won't go into great detail on just why it is that IV vitamin drips are useless. You can watch our video in the top right hand corner for that. What is important to note is that most of what you are going to be getting in these drips is not going to provide you with any benefit that a good diet will not have. As a result, you're not going to see improvements in the necessary hormones for fertility, you're not going to see the necessary changes in basic physiological functions like the uterine cycle or production of sperm or ovum with these. It's simply not going to happen if you already have an even halfway decent diet. What you're going to experience instead is putting more pressure on your body because it now needs to deal with not only what you normally deal with throughout the body's normal cycle of various metabolic processes, for example, removing urine, removing excess glucose, removing metabolites from whatever else you've been consuming, all of these things, now you've added a huge increase in fluid through the IV therapy, because it's carried in water, or more likely saline, that this in turn then needs to be removed by the kidneys along with all of the contents of the drip. Some of these trace elements, vitamins and more can also have adverse effects. Any claims that the contents of the drip can help with fertility are at best gross exaggerations and at worst outright fraudulent. Going to news about other things that are growing, we have lab-grown meat and a, a concern about it. Lab-grown meat is being touted as the uh, ethically conscientious and uh, good-sold option or alternative to, well, real meat. The problem is it's not actual meat, it is cells that have been grown in media and then fundamentally reconstituted into something that is meat-like. This is why it can not be sold in most countries as meat itself. Any kind of cell culture is a very labour and resource intensive process. This is one reason why lab grown meat isn't currently a widely facilitated product. It's simply not cost effective to do so. And this is the issue. As researchers from the University of California Davis have pointed out, these processes and resources have a very large impact on the environment. And this is one question why it's been touted as the ethical or morally superior option. After all, you're treating the relatively environmentally effective method of producing meat through animals for the far worse, and up to 25 times worse, process of creating cell-cultured meat. The article goes into an interesting aspect to this, and that is, currently, the lab-grown meat must meet pharmaceutical levels of quality control. If it was lowered to a food-grade threshold, the amount of expense and environmental impact would also drop accordingly, roughly a quarter more than what you would find with normal meat production methods using actual animals. The only problem with this article is, well, twofold. First, they're arguing that we should focus on improving animal growing methods of meat, that is, your more typical or standard agricultural technologies. The second is that it ignores the certain need for increasing productivity and efficiency of this technology, not necessarily for now, but the future. To put it simply, if, for example, Elon Musk's plans to uh, colonize Mars were to move forward, they would need some sort of protein-rich product. Chances are that individuals who are colonizing Mars aren't going to be particularly happy about eating soy protein when they could have instead been eating something very close to real meat. Because of this, whilst we agree overall with the general gist of what they're claiming, that technology has problems, it's also worth pointing out that this technology is in the very early days of development.
In other news that's related to microbial organisms, we have viral infections and the weird reality that most of us are carrying a particular virus but don't really notice it. The cytomegalovirus. For most people, this is a dormant virus that's basically doing nothing to you in particular. Because it's dormant, you wouldn't even think to look for it. This is a uh, weird thing. Not because people aren't aware of it, but because of how much of at least the US population is infected. More than half of the US population will be infected by the time they turn 40. And it's fairly similar across the globe, but you have a range between 40 and 70%. One of the major reasons why this is such a concerning virus is not that most people have it, that is a worry, but rather it can be transferred from mother to child during pregnancy. This means that as more and more people get infected, there is an increasing risk of more and more people being born with it. If you are born with cytomegalovirus and it's active at the time, it can lead to massive issues to do with neurodevelopment. Things like hearing loss and cerebral palsy are just some examples. Going on to other viral related news and the retraction of one of the more controversial papers around the HPV vaccine. It's now been retracted and not with the author's agreement, but this article is one of the more well-known issues. It was a very controversial paper when it was published, and its methodology was very flawed. The researchers claimed that if they gave mice the HPV vaccine, they had signs of neurological damage. As you can imagine, that is a very bold claim, and it needed compelling evidence behind it. It did not have compelling evidence. As a result, the article was ripped to shreds by any and every academic who had a good understanding of what they were looking at. The paper was originally published in 2016, and it required a lot of, well, as we mentioned, bad methodological approaches to be able to get the result they did. The first and most obvious issue we have is the ridiculous dose of the vaccine given to the mice. This dose was way above what should have been considered appropriate for the mouse model they were using. The second issue, which is somewhat more significant, involved the use of a toxin to increase the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. As you can imagine, when you change the blood-brain barrier and you give them an unusually high dose, you are likely to see brain damage because you've just screwed up two different things in your study. By itself, the embarrassment of the retraction is not particularly interesting news. It's what the paper did to uptake of the vaccine that is important. There was a very high vaccination rate amongst eligible young girls in Japan with this vaccine. It went from nearly 70% of eligible young girls getting the vaccine to nearly zero. Shifting to other controversy and the approval of Elon Musk's neural link for human clinical trials. Elon Musk is something of a polarizing figure in many terms, particularly with the way Twitter's been operating recently. But other than that, he has a number of other businesses. SpaceX is perhaps the most well known. But there's also Starlink, which created issues around the satellites interfering with astronomy, and now branching out to human implants of a kind. The idea is to build a brain implant that is going to be far more capable of connecting to the human brain than what other existing devices are currently capable of doing. Much of the technology being used in this is not exactly new. It involves a wireless device, in this case a small computer-like device that uses Bluetooth to communicate with an external computer. It has a small, uh, let's say, a chipset that gets put into the skull. From this chipset, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of tiny threads that would link to the various neurons in the brain. Each of these is tiny, but each of them connects to its own individual neuron. And this is where things will get interesting. If the device is able to work as it's intended, it would be an incredibly, well, significant movement in the control of things like prosthetic limbs 
as it could theoretically give people who have had limbs amputated back complete control of the prostheses and have it act just like their original limbs did. We also need to talk about things like Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, and more. All of these, if we have the appropriate technology, research, and developments, could be not necessarily treated, but far better controlled with this device. The reason this process has taken so long, given that the original publicity around it began in February 2021, is that the FDA had a long list of concerns, and it appears that most of those have been, if not resolved, at least satisfied with long-term data collection. Part of this has to do with the safety of the procedure to install the implant. The safety is now being fixed by having just about all of the work done by a robot. The robot removes most of the issues that occur if a human who is prone to problems, particularly accidents, failures, errors and inconsistencies, might create. The article we link you to has a great deal more detail on the other concerns, things like the safety of the battery, side effects, the movement of wire, particularly those involved in the, well, receiving and analyzing of the neuron activity, removing the implant, data privacy, and about the problems around actually installing the device. Next we have what could be called a case study, and related to medical news, but it's more the lack of an issue rather than the presence of one. Jo Cameron is a 75-year-old Scottish woman, and she is pretty much unable to experience pain. The importance of this is not so much the actual lack of pain, as this is a risk and issue for her and herself. Rather, it's what's going on with her genetics and body that could, at least in theory, lead to the ability to better target pain relief. For example, if you're able to target the genes that are responsible, or whatever they're responsible for controlling, producing, or however it is that it works, you may in theory be able to target that pathway and turn it off. If it's a chronic condition, this would be incredibly useful. Not so much for, say, surgeries or periods where you only need temporary anesthesia or analgesia. Shifting to food and food security, it's an interesting article about how fungi could currently be a bigger concern for food security than anything else you have to worry about. For the most part, things like bacteria aren't a big issue because we have to worry about that once the food's been processed or while we're storing it. Then you have things like pests that eat food, which we can deal with using pesticides. Fungi, on the other hand, are somewhat more of a problem. This is something we've already experienced once when bananas were wiped out, and we had to replace them with the newest version, the Cavendish, which itself is now threatened once more. Many of our most common food sources, rice, wheat, corn, soybeans and potatoes, are currently threatened by fungi. It would be something of a letdown if humanity died, not through fungi or other diseases turning us into zombies, or some other horrible monstrosity, but rather because we screwed up our food supply and we all starved to death slowly. The article points out the basic issue that most fungicides currently available only target a single pathway within fungi. This means that as more fungi develop resistances to that pathway, our fungicides are going to prove more and more useless. In other food-related news, the idea that we might add gold to wine and make it taste that much better. This might seem odd. After all, if you add gold, you're just going to make it incredibly expensive, and it's going to be as useful as gold leaf toilet paper. However, this isn't necessarily the case. There is a rationale behind adding gold to wine, or at least parts of the winemaking process. Gold itself is rather reactive, and this can be very useful if you're trying to remove volatile products from the wine itself. In this case, volatile sulfur compounds. This is based on research from Australia, and it was looking at whether or not you could use it to take away things like the egg smell or the canned corn smell that occurs from the sulfur that is there.
Wine by itself, no matter what you're doing, whether you add sulfur extra to what's there or not, will produce sulfur. That's because it's part of the fermentation process. And that's the issue. It occurs regardless. This is where the research is useful itself. Not because the gold is used as gold, but rather the gold is added to a much larger system, which begins with what look like almost beads. These beads are used to hold the gold along with whatever else it's used as the polymer or neutral compound that it's bound to. This creates a coating, and that coating interacts with the undesirable compounds in the wine, taking them out. What is especially useful here is that it is a renewable product, as in you don't need to throw it out after each use. Leaving this in wine for just 24 hours removed 45% of free hydrogen sulfide, and that's enough to make a huge difference. It only takes a very small amount to either identify the smell or taste and ruin the wine entirely. Shifting to animal news and the argument that marsupials are more evolved than most mammals, including humans. Marsupials are truly weird. Not just because you find many of them in Australia, but because of what they do and how they do it. For example, some of them can carry up to two pregnancies at the same time. They've long been considered the intermediary step between egg-laying animals and mammals that we are familiar with. For example, humans versus a chicken. The researchers are arguing that marsupials are more advanced in some respects than humans and other mammals by extension, not necessarily because of their weird behaviours, but rather how it is that they've evolved to fit into the niche that they have. What they have evolved required a great many changes that are very specific, very specialized, and very, very difficult to develop compared to humans. For example, the ability to give birth to a still undeveloped, what is effectively a fetus, and have it grow into an infant inside the pouch of the parent. They argue that this shows marsupials aren't an intermediary species, Rather, they are their own entirely unique branch on the phylogenetic tree. Next we have how you might be able to control pests, and particularly pests like rodents, using ultrasound. Ultrasound is able to induce torpor amongst rodents and other animals. This is a behavior in which animals reduce their body temperature and metabolic rate to go into what is, for all intents and purposes, hibernation. This means that if you could, at least in theory, induce torpor in rodents like rats and mice, you could prevent rodent populations during seasonal booms in which they increase drastically in number and destroy huge amounts of crops, or during something like winter when a lot of them enter into residential areas trying to find somewhere warm, safe, dry, and probably have access to a great deal of food. This is fine based on the knowledge of how these animals behave, but the important thing here is that, for the most part, mice will enter into a state of torpor, but rats do not. This technology works for both species, and that allows us to more effectively and non-invasively control much of what's being observed. Assuming that their research can be applied outside of the laboratory setting and demonstrate effect. The evidence already is pretty damn interesting, but it gets better because not only have they been able to induce torpor, but they're able to figure out what part of the brain is being activated by the ultrasound, and in theory from this they can then figure out just how exactly it induces the behavior that it does. We have a lot of questions about how the application of this could be useful beyond the immediate role it has in rodent populations, largely because looking at it, it doesn't seem like it might be as useful for humans at present. We realistically can't put humans to sleep permanently because of issues around things like atrophy. This means that if you want to, say, have cryopods, this wouldn't really work. Rather, we'd have to look at this as a step as part of a larger process. For example, the initial stage in 
cryopods by reducing somebody's body temperature and metabolic processes and then freezing them. But that is a long way away from this research right now. In other neurology-related news, and particularly focusing back now on research integrity, it appears that a lot of data is being faked in this area. And again, this is no surprise. Unfortunately, there is the publish or perish mentality in academia. That is, you must make publications, you must get them into reasonably prestigious journals, and that you must be able to continuously do this. Given the difficulty in getting data at the best of times, and the reliability of data at the best of times, this can be very hard. With a little bit of fudging of numbers, well, it's not so difficult anymore, and you can keep publishing at a reasonable rate. Unless you're in charge of a much larger lab, in which case, the same problems exist, but now you have many people to fudge data for you. This is where a study looking at neuro research in particular has found that up to 28% had a reasonable chance of having made up or plagiarized data used. The study itself is relying on machine learning, although some sources describe it as artificial intelligence and, well, no, it's not able to operate independently, therefore not artificial intelligence. They developed their machine learning algorithm to pick out what they describe as red flags with up to 90% accuracy. They then ran this through 5,000 articles published in 2020. This is where we get the 28% figure of either made up or plagiarized. Admittedly, with 5,000 articles and the 90% accuracy, we'd expect there to be about 1,250 papers that were caught by this tool. Even then, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are faked with data, only that what they suspect to be faked data. And this is where the further proofing comes into play. Of every 100 that they flagged, 63 were faked and 37 were actual real publications that had done what they were meant to do. This means we need to further reduce that 90% accuracy rate considerably by about a third. So now we're sitting at around 60% accuracy. It's only slightly better than a coin flip. Shifting to technology news, and this is all about Europe's largest battery. The UK is looking to launch a massive battery to store energy. It's going to cost £75 million, and it will be the largest in Europe. Officially it's been opened, although likely it's not yet fully operational. This is a system meant to be able to store up to 196 megawatt hours of electricity per cycle. This means it should be able to operate about 300,000 homes for about two hours. This of course assumes a consistent demand across those two hours. This is one of just six batteries that are looking to be set up over the coming year. Admittedly, the total capacity is expected to be somewhere around 500 megawatts with a draw of one gigawatt an hour. In computing news, we have a interesting development in the idea of a computer that might be better than digital computing, although this is a very, very early study with it being solely a prototype. The current best technology that's expected to come out is going to be something like quantum computing, but that is quite a ways off. This is where something called a reservoir computer is at least useful as an intermediary step. The reservoir computer is an entirely analog system, which means rather than relying on binary processes, ones and zeros, it keeps a static or permanent memory of events, and this lets it model what's going to happen next. And that's the big difference here. It is somewhat superior to the modern digital computer for things that are going over a long term and need to be modeled whereas your digital computer is much better for things that are more constantly changing and shifting. The researchers give an example of having a bucket full of water, and that you throw a stone of varying sizes into this bucket for each day of rain, and that the size of the stone corresponds to that day of rain. If there's none at all, there is no stone thrown. As the waves of the water in the bucket move around, they interact, and this creates a 
average effect that you can say this is what the next likely outcome will be. If there's no effect at all, you could say that there'll be no change. If there's a decrease, you could say that there'll be less rain. And it's all based on the continuous presence of the original data interacting with the data that came before, or in this case, ripples in the water. Of course, this example doesn't really work for the kind of computation we're talking about, which is why they had to make up a system themselves with something called a soliton. These are waves that will reinforce themselves and therefore travel not only long distances without losing their shape and power, but also be able to reliably be used as a interaction for the next wave coming through. This means you can keep the signal constantly moving and not lose it, which is what you need for this sort of analog computer. You need that permanency. For the purposes of modeling something like this, the researchers found that they were able to outperform a fairly decent digital computer by comparison. Shifting to drawing energy from the environment now, but combining what we've just learned about not only storage, but also memory to get energy from nothing but air. The idea of this is to try and draw on the energy that's in the air, but specifically the water that's in the air. The researchers draw a comparison between what they're doing and the idea of electricity leading to lightning. You get moisture in the air in the form of clouds. When they suddenly release the energy within them, you get lightning. Well, if you control that release by passing the air through a tiny pore less than 100 nanometers in diameter, you're able to get the energy out of that using the device that they've created. This is, however, not a large-scale or practical solution because, well, it's incredibly hard to make pores that tiny. The device works in a manner very similar to what you would see with, say, lithium-ion batteries. That is, you have an extremely positively charged side, which is the top of the device, where more water molecules are hitting it, but not passing through, versus the bottom side, where there are very few molecules passing through, and therefore a net negative charge is generated. With clouds, this is how you get lightning. However, with this device, you can draw that power and therefore create exactly that. It's able to create about 260 millivolts in a fairly typical environment, so nowhere near enough to be able to do anything significant. But that's because the technology is tiny. That is, they've created a single thin film. If you start stacking these thin films up, you could arguably get much more power. And it's exactly the same idea behind lithium-ion batteries. You don't have one big flat sheet. Rather, you have these sheets coiled or folded in such a way that you get the constant movement of the electrolytes and therefore that discrepancy in charge. Going to astronomical news now, we have a not necessarily earth-breaking discovery, but certainly one that could be very interesting. It's a planet about 87 light years away, so not exactly very helpful. The important thing here is that it's a planet orbiting its star at roughly the same distance from its sun as Earth is from ours, and that's helpful. This sounds great for a second Earth, the problem is that orbit is only possible because another planet has moved its orbit out of a circular orbit to something that is more weirdly shaped. That weird orbit means that it's neither frozen as a planet, but it's also not a molten mass. The problem with this is not that it's in an ideal area to theoretically be able to support life. It's the planet itself that is a problem. Because it is being interfered with by this other planet that's disrupting its orbit, its surface and is constantly disrupted by the molten mantle underneath being constantly pulled up and interfered with, creating volcanoes and a hellish surface. That is, unless you look at the dark side of the moon. Wait, planet. The dark side could theoretically be cool enough to support life as it appears that it may have an atmosphere. This means that while one side of this planet is a death world, the other 
could theoretically be able to support life, or it would be more accurate to say it creates the right conditions to theoretically support life. The last news we have for you is the rather bizarre robotic snake made by NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratories. This bizarre creation is intended to be able to travel to places unlike the Moon and Mars where there is less hospitability to transitable vehicles. By creating this snake-like creature, it can move through all sorts of environments that something that's wheeled or tracked would never be able to manage, or something with legs would simply not be able to survive in. And this bizarre robot is able to transit narrow gaps and environments that are incredibly dangerous, and it's intended to look at something like Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons. This is a planet covered in a frozen surface, but the surface is constantly disrupted by geological activity leading to vents opening. If you were able to get a robot down below the ice cap that is the top of the planet, you might be able to figure out what's going on inside of it, and importantly, be able to see whether or not there is actual possibilities for at least preliminary organic molecules, if not life itself, near the vents that lie deep in its oceans. Well, that's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.